my name is Amy Farris. Welcome to the Brookdale Visiting Artist Program. I'm here today with guest artist Kate Okeson. Kate, welcome. I'm wondering if we could start out with you telling us a little bit about yourself, um, your educational background and where you're coming from. Hi, Amy. Thanks for having me. Uh, this has been a great program to be a part of. Uh, my educational background uh, actually came through a, a really unique opportunity when I was a student at Mason Grove School of the Arts, which mm -hmm. is part of Rutgers University. Right. Um, and we had a graphic design program that pretty much operated separately than the traditional fine arts program. And two of the professors together received a grant to begin funding an interdisciplinary program between graphic design and the printmaking department, which ultimately became a book arts program. Wonderful. Um, and that was when my sort of pr predilection, my, my, what I wanted to do was make these things that looked like books became the media of artists' books. Okay. Um, and, and from there, my study of fibers and, and all of these other things related to books uh, came to the fore. So. It's, you know, and that kind of leads into my first question for you because you do so many things. Um, I mean, you do video, you do installation, you do photography, but I think today we're going to focus on you as a book artist because I think a lot of people don't really understand what a, a, a book artist or artist books are. Could you talk a little bit about that, please, and maybe ed educate our audience and me on sure. what book arts are? Um, it, it's an interesting thing because I end up largely defining um, the not part of it while leading yeah. people to what the book itself is. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I typically try and ask people, what is it that you think an artist book is? So I understand where they're coming from. A lot of that ends up being, you know, the really expensive books that we buy that are for our coffee table. Right, right. And to take them away from that into the, for, away from the object of the book to the idea of a book mm -hmm. and have them move to the idea of a co cover and what is the role of a cover? What are the ideas of pages and how do pages operate and what is a binding mean? And that's how I move people into the definition of it. Okay. It's largely a conceptual practice that does have a physical object. A lot of times it does involve these disciplines of printing and paper making and uh, the traditions behind binding and, and the construction of these books. Right, and I think most people think of book binding when they think of, if they think of artist books at all, it involves maybe bookmaking or book binding. But you do something a little different. Um, and, 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 and I think maybe when you're talking about what a book is not, I want to touch on that a little bit because your books, um, the experience of your books, and I use the word experience because I think that's what you want to have happen. You've talked about how you want the, the, the person who's interacting with your books, you want to get them to do what you want them to do, yeah. and so that it becomes an experience of reading. I know you want them to read, but you want them to do something as well. And whenever I experience one of your pieces, I, it starts out for me one way, and then suddenly I'm nudged in another direction. So could you talk a little bit about that? What exactly you're trying to do with these books, which is sure. very interesting. I think part of it is my personality and really <laughs> liking to, to nudge people a little yeah. bit. Um, part of it is that I don't like the idea of something just being, uh, just occupying one place, one space in time. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an opportunity with artist books to be temporal, um, to exist almost as a performance does, to, to have a, an experience over time, and, and then an, an, a, a chance or an opportunity to reflect on that and revisit it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the things I'm trying to get people to do are to not realize that they're interacting with the book until they've already into the experience or afterwards. Um, I manipulate, I try to manipulate people's actions based on the um, the way the book is presented, and mm -hmm. as I, I've shared with you in the past, mm -hmm. that may be a deconstructed book where I've had pages suspended between the ceiling and the floor. So the binding itself is actually the person walking between the pages. Right. They, the concept then of the binding becomes the person's experience themselves. Right. So I, I try to, to uh, get you to participate as part of it. It cannot exist without its audience. These are not things that get made and put away on a shelf. You right. know? And I think I, I guess that leads to my next question is, how much control do you want over the viewer? How much con control can you expect over the viewer? We're all bringing our own stuff yeah. to any work of art. And I know that um, you've talked about certain books where you kind of had to let go of what might happen sure. to the book. It's precious. And you've talked about pe maybe having people wear white gloves. And did you want to do that? How much control are you looking for, or can you expect? I, I don't know if I have a static expectation of that, and it may change depending on the, the content or some of the subject I'm approaching inside okay. of the books. Okay. Because at, you know, at the end of it, it, I've moved away from a period of time where the structure is the totality of the book and its meaning, and I've moved into a place where there is some kind of content, be it image or text at mm -hmm. the point. So with greater um, 
sort of subject matter being held within this construction, I shift some of my expectations because I'm also trying to leave room for the viewer to have a, a reaction to the content right. and experience that con that might be brought to them through the physical uh, or the artifact of the book. It's a lot. It seems like a lot. You're tr you're having a lot going on, which is always wonderful to experience in a work of art. I think it just the different layers and you can go deeper and deeper and to hold that viewer there I think is, is such a great thing. Um, you brought one of your books with you. You have yeah. it behind us right here and I, I love this piece. I think this was the first piece of yours I experienced where I was really suddenly I felt I was being nudged and all of a sudden it just kind of opened up to me. And you, you had this with us when you did our evening presentation here at Brookdale and it looks very benign. It looks like a, a traditional sure. book but I think what we need to let viewers know is this, this book opens up to 50 feet long. Yeah. Um, and, and you've talked about this, that this was the, the sort of crowning achievement of a studio residency you had at Gallery of Faro in Newark. Yes. Um, and I think you said you had a 30-foot wall. Yeah, I had, I had a real big, long wall. It was interesting because it's sort of, if you take the, oh, the traditional railroad apartment and turn it right. on its side, right. the, the studios as part of the residency were, were laid out like that. So you typically okay. would walk through a studio or two on the way to your others. But we had, you know, tons of a literal and figurative space around us. And I did end up having this wall, a, one of which I've never had to myself before. You go from being a child to like uh, trying to take away the family space or getting into sort of <laughs> right. trouble for that right. to right. being in college and you're always sharing and then yeah. you get into, you know, what are you doing post-college? You, you have this much space. I, and I, frankly, this part of the question uh, does have to do with some of the output I make is small and has definitely, right. you know, I'm sort of like a koi in a pond. You know, you only grow as big as your, the, your surroundings, right? right. right? The, work, and, the work is defined by the space. Sure. Yeah. And, sure. and when I had larger space, I was really able to contemplate things at, um, at great distance. Okay. Um, that negative space around this one object you know, this didn't, this is actually small compared to the original sketches. Right. And I had painted the whole wall and I built this timeline. There's a line that comes through right. this book, right. a, a physical drawn line. Right. And I started with that along and I was making images and bringing them up and down. And eventually I collapsed that into what would become um, this book. But right. it's very much a product of having that amount of space. That, yeah, that was my question. Was that dictated by the amount of sure. space that you had? Sure. And I think finally, if I could just ask you to maybe briefly talk about, for young artists and young students as, as they're working, one of the interesting things about you is it seemed like you developed your, the way you were going to talk visually and then you brought the content in. How important do you feel is it to keep those two things separate? Do they work together? Is it very organic in the development of the artist? Does it depend on the artist? I, I think that was my process. I was unpacking different ways that people read. And there, you know, there's a very academic piece to what I do. Right. Um, I've been a long time teacher. I'm very concerned about pedagogy and mm -hmm. how one teaches. I'm a little bit of an autodidact when it comes to certain things. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely have that approach that I needed to unpack and be aware of what it is that I'm asking my audience to do. Mm -hmm. How am I teaching them? What am I asking them to read? Uh, to what degree am I asking them to have a literacy or a fluency? These mm -hmm. are very important questions right. to me. Um, you know, with true text, when we are reading a word, um, most of my audience is literate. Some of them are fluent mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. in the context of the book. So I, I personally, my process was to take these things apart. When I work with students, I try to get them to a place where they're metacognitive, where they have an idea of what it is that they do know and what it is that they're aiming to know mm -hmm. and, and approach it from that perspective. These are things that we can get to. Right. And then they bring the materials, the choice yeah. of materials in and maybe work those things in tandem yeah. so that they become fluent in their own visual language sure. at the same time as they are seeking to communicate with a viewer and yeah. understand what it is they're trying to say and get the viewer to understand as yeah. well. That's great advice for them. I know that many students struggle with that. Yeah. Um, is there anything that I can add or anything that you want to say at this point about, I mean, I, I think one of the other things too is community. Um, how important do you feel a local community is? We're right next to New York City. Yeah. Um, how important it is for a local community to support artists who maybe speak in different voices from the norm? Yeah, I, I've made, that's part of my mission in my education field as a teacher is to make sure that some of the things that I experienced about that's not a real medium. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, you're an artist, what do you paint? Mm -hmm. And I, and I 
you know, I bristle at that a little bit because I'm, I'm getting older. I can take a little bit of attitude with people about that. I'm like, well, look who knows how much about art, right? Uh, but I try to impart something on my students and the people around me that we have to make some space for ourselves. And part of that is an open and accepting community. I, there are definitely outlets in the area that, that are, are doing that. But I think it's very hard because without a, an experience of what these other media are, right. we have a hard time making room for them. Uh, you know, I still participate largely in a community in Newark and, and, and New York as a result because I, the sort of cosmopolitan attitude leaves a lot more room open. We are, we are in a bedroom community to the city. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe the direction is that we're, some of us in the area are working artists, but not all the working artists here are showing here. It would be amazing if we could ever get all of those folks that are, that are making things out in one space to say, hey, this is what I'm making too. You know? I think that would be great. And I think, it starts, I think it starts with our local community in a school like Brookdale and with our students here sure. that, because they loved you when you came and did a workshop for them. And I think that it, it helps educate them and help them understand that you know, art is not so narrowly defined, yeah. that, they, that they get to choose maybe what it is in partnership with a viewer. Absolutely. And if it works, you know, and then, then then they can call it. It's what it dialogue. Was. It's dialogue, exactly. As some as we're having here yeah. today. Great. Um, thank you so much. It's it's been such a pleasure having you um, here at Brookdale as part of our visiting artist program. I can't thank you enough. So much, Kate. Quite welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to show you some images from the workshop Kate conducted with our students here at Brookdale. It was a two-hour hands-on workshop on one of the techniques that she uses in her bookmaking uh, work and the students actually got to experience making a very simple book and learning a brand new technique. So stay tuned. Thank you. Planning a large scale event or conference? Consider Brookdale Community College and its versatile Collins Arena. The Collins Arena is the premier venue for all kinds of corporate and community events. Live concerts and celebrity happenings, trade shows and expositions, sporting events and tournaments. The Collins Arena has countless layout options to meet your needs. Bring your next event to life at the Collins Arena at Brookdale Community College. Go to brookdalecc.edu slash events and start planning your next event now. The meditation series will strengthen your spirit with peace and balance. Intro to Zen Meditation provides a foundation of the basic principles of Zen instruction. Sitting, walking, and breathing techniques allowing one's mind to rest. Allowing peace within helps develop powerful ways to invoke inner harmony and radiate peace whenever you are in need, no matter where you are. Healing Energy Meditations provides tools to help gently calm the mind to find the quiet place within. Go to brookdalecc.edu and click on Continuing Education, then Lifelong Learning. I'm going to manipulate you, the audience, to do something you didn't think you would do with art. You think you would do it with the book, but you don't necessarily do it with art. And I've been walking that line and trying to you know, make you do my bidding with the artwork. So I get, I get a rise out of you, which is like the thing I was accused of as a kid, right? You're just doing that to get a rise out of me. So that's what I do, kind of professionally, in that sense. So um, I brought a couple examples of books in just to show you a few of the things that I've done in the past couple of years, uh, give you an idea of what my work looks like and the place from which I'm speaking. And, and then I'm going to show you how to make a super quick book. It's a one sheet, three folds, one cut. It's a super easy uh, means of making something that folds and behaves like a book, and you guys probably um, we'll, we'll feel a little more sort of confident within this medium, and then you realize, eh, anything I say is a book. I've got 19 paper napkins on the table, and I did something with them, and I'm going to stack them, and that's a book. And absolutely it is. So um, we'll get started with that, okay? <laughs> First to the third, down through the center. Here to here. Stays on like iron, iron oxygen. Mm -hmm. Laser copy specifically. And goes specifically. through the kiln? 
I lay, you no, lay, I, I gotta hear about this. <laughs> right, so okay, okay. you lay it on, you I mean, work, you, okay. because there's there's iron oxide, and we use straight Are up you iron. Using the meetings? No, using a glaze. No, no, no. You're not using that's anything you put yet. The count. Okay. You just fresh copy through the slip Black. right on, and you fire it. Paper, 1850 degrees yeah. disappears. Yeah. What's left? Iron oxide. Wow, that's really neat. And then you can in your glaze fire. Oh yes. Wow. So we're, we're working on that one. Yeah. And we, we do rock hoop firing at school too, so we're, we're working on you know, some of those high fire techniques. We'll see what happens. I made a covering and it grabbed the inks and then I soaked it when it's totally dry and took the fiber off. But your inks are saturated in that. Cool, right? No, oh, it was an octopus leg. I wasn't kidding. It was the Times food section, and there was like nine octopus legs on it or something. Do you, do you understand the order now, right? Because yes. the glaze medium has to be in contact with the type that you want. All right? You want a pretty good coat like that. All right? And it has to totally dry before you can soak it off. All right? All right. Yeah, no, no, nothing's upside down. This is this is all intended to be, sorry, like this. <laughs> I'm doing it for myself, well, not for you. Down. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Yeah, well. <laughs> be careful about your edges mm -hmm. because they will tear. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I try and hold things against my hand a little yeah. bit for support. All right. All right. How do I get this on the paper? Just like whatever, whatever you want to do. You could actually use more of the medium. Oh, that's wonderful. Right? And it, so and it, so so it coats shiny. it onto. Yeah, for sure. It's all area has contact, including the edges, and then you let it dry. That's it. It's right where it is right now. Yep, and when it's dry, then you'll go back with water on your finger and you'll start to wet the fiber and it'll start to pick up. And it'll just leave the toner, the image from the other side. Okay. Affixed in the medium. Okay, so just take out this whole back side. Yeah. Nice, fun. This is so much fun. Yeah. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Isn't that beautiful? I love it. I absolutely love it. I'm going to do something like this. I'm doing a book for my granddaughter in front of her. Dad. Great. Yes. I'm going to That's do her images and everything with this. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's temporal. So, yes. Uh -huh. I mean, very interesting. It, it's yeah. uh, when I'm when I'm discussing mm -hmm. this in a um, in my longer practice. Uh -huh. Right. These are performances. I've gotten you to do the performances because it doesn't, right. it's not right. a static right. experience. Yeah. It isn't Twombly, yeah. Blade yeah. Door yeah. on the wall, yeah. Yeah. but you have to turn the page and you address different parts at different times. Exactly. But to do it, to design them, mm -hmm. to compose them, mm -hmm. uh, I think the dimension is huge, the yeah. complexity is huge, the choices are huge mm -hmm. because if you, if you have to kind of a mentally and visually walk through all the possibilities mm -hmm. and the, the different mm -hmm. interactions or yeah. the reactions. It's a decision tree that sort of happens. It's huge. Right? The decision yeah. tree. Yeah. It can it can be a lot of fun. Yes. Um, and sometimes something unexpected come up. Absolutely. Like yeah. a, a, a book I had done uh -huh. a while ago we had uh -huh. chalkboard paint around it. So you could read the book, or you could write on it yourself. Right. <laughs> and my, you know, the audience is, what do we, what do we do? Well, whatever you want to do. Yeah. Right. Play with it, essentially. Yeah. I used a um, 
just a sketch that I had done of um, a hand and this little mechanical contraption that I was thinking about maybe making one day. Um, so that was just a sketch which we uh, I transferred on. It looks beautiful. Um, thank you. Really successful. Um, everything else was photocopies. Um, I'm working on one right now that's just some maps that I had photocopied um, from years ago. Um, some little music note stuff that I had. Um, and then this is actually a ticket from a ball that I attended. <laughs> it's beautiful. Uh, which was just the, lovely. That shiny surface, that is a technique where you, um, I think she had you put the medium on the paper and then you soaked it in the water. And so it, it retains that sort of shiny quality. I think yeah, so cool. this is just the medium straight on the paper itself. And then it completely dried and I soaked it to get all of it off the back, which gives it the nice kind of, if I had another image under here, it would have bled through um, nicely, which is one thing I didn't get to explore, is overlapping them, which would have been nice. Interestingly enough, um, I'm actually doing a special project at the moment that's kind of an art book. I, I kind of thought, especially with my project, um, I definitely wanted the, the interaction between the viewer and the art piece itself to be a very important thing, but, uh, and I guess there's a bit of manipulation in my book as well, mm -hmm. um, but I hadn't really thought about it that way until she mentioned it. But I was like, yeah, I could see that. That'd we be got it. All right. So now is planning, thinking about where you want your images to go or what images you're going to use, getting them cut and ready to use the medium. OK? Basically, I'm trying to get um, all the aspects that would go into like your average like adventure video game, but into like a choose your own adventure book style. And so that sort of manipulation, leading them through these paths and where they're supposed to go, and then you have options of different pages you could visit, and not knowing what they might choose, I have to like anticipate the glitches and the problems that might arise if they choose something I don't expect. Um, and so that much like anticipating what people will do and trying to sort of steer them in the right direction is definitely a part of what I was doing. Um, and her talking about it was very, very interesting and very helpful. I'm glad that like someone else is thinking about the same thing that I'm thinking about at the same time. And I'm glad she was here because this is like right, right up my alley. So I'm almost done. I actually wish this had happened before my project. Really helpful, right? okay. It would have been nice to use some of the techniques that we learned today because uh, they were very helpful. I sort of want to tie up, first I want to review a little bit of what I've seen. And I, I saw a few confused looks as I was explaining. So in the, initially I'm showing you guys my books and you're like, kind of like books, I'm not so sure. And then some of you guys got some images out and what I saw was this uh, immediate attachment to certain images and that driving some of the direction of your books. And I think you guys are doing some really interesting stuff. Um, from the technical aspect, I think a few of you have certainly learned some of the flexibility and inflexibilities of some of the papers. Um, like I had said earlier, I frequently work with photocopied images. Toner for me, because I'm not working in color typically, toner has always been a, a no-fail go-to all the time. You know, always works. Good black and white photocopy is hands above many other things. Not to say that different publications don't work. The co more coded it is, the less access you have to the pigments underneath of it or the kinds of inks. So if you're going to be using this process uh, moving forward, you really want to evaluate your source, where it's coming from, what it looks like initially. You also want to be thinking about the destination. How degraded is this going to get? How many layers of the medium do I need to use? Am I using it on a painting? Do I want semi-translucent, semi very translucent, transparent, more opaque? Um, do I want to pigment the medium? For sure, you could take an ink or a watercolor or some you know, loose water-based type pigment and add it in, and I'm not talking from an archival or a light fast standpoint. I sort of belong to the Kiki Smith line of things where if it falls apart, that's just really built into the artwork itself, you know? I am not, you know, there are definitely some things I've made that are archival and they're stored properly and I never show them to anybody as a result, right? No, oh, should it never see the light of day? Um, but most of the work I make is, I'm asking people to handle it and move around it. And, and not necessarily in traditional uh, gallery or museum like settings. So there's sort of this known quantity, something's gonna happen, you know? At any rate, 
Think about your destination and how you're going to use these. Do you care if it starts to peel? Is it going to respond to humidity, dryness, heat? Do you want it to respond to heat, dryness, humidity? All of these variables change the outcome of this. Do you want to stretch it? Do you want to shrink it? Do you want to cut it in thin strips? You know, it, it's very pliable depending on your particular aesthetic. Okay, so going forward, realize that just a little bit of this stuff goes a long way. You can get all different size tubes of it in places. I have, the one I've been using, I think I've had it for 15 years. I mean, really, it's the same. Amy will attest to, like, the label is really their old branding. Like, I've been using it forever. Um, you know, it, through that whole, I've, really for years. So it lasts a long time if you keep it out of the sunlight and keep it zipped up and everything else. Great. Um, newspapers. This is why the New York Times is still in print. I'm absolutely guarantee it's because artists keep it alive. They have to. We use it in ceramics. We use it in everything, right? That's how, how it happens. Um, if you have specific technical questions for me, um, you can reach me by email. Uh, Amy has it as well. It's kaoxin at gmail or kate at kateoxin.com, either one. You can always look up my .com and see my, my little online gallery and things like that. That's all cool. Um, I really hope you're coming to the talk tonight. I'm going to talk a little more specifically um, uh, about the trajectory of my work and its relationship to graphic design and performance and some other things of that nature. Um, so it's been a pleasure, and I really hope that you guys um, feel like you've gotten something interesting to use from this. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.